Have you ever been to a great celebration? Something that was just, you know, almost beyond your wildest imagination. Something that may have been thrown in honor of you, or it may have been something you were simply blessed to participate in. A great event. As I began preparation in this message, I began thinking about what kind of celebrations had I been a part of that really stuck with me and, and are keen in my memory. Last year, I turned 70, and Georgetta threw me a surprise birthday party. I knew family was coming, so was, that, that wasn't a surprise, but I walked into the restaurant, and there was a room full of people. And so, over the next few hours, we ate together, we laughed together, some of us even cried together. I was really blessed. There were so many positive affirmations that day. I'm blessed to be able to serve here. I'm grateful. But it's a real honor to, to have a celebration event like that. Maybe my best memory is not one for me. It was one for Georgetta. It was her 50th birthday. Sorry about that. It was her 50th birthday. Her aunt and I planned it. We held it at a, a, an inn in Ohio called the Golden Lamb. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It's over 200 years old. It's hosted all kinds of famous celebrities, including nine presidents of the United States. So it is a venue that's outstanding. And so we came together that night, our best friends and her family and my family and the pastor that had married us and his wife, and we had a great celebration that night. It was a feast. Oh, by the way, when you see feast in the Bible, think celebration, because that's what they were intended to be. Today we're continuing our study of Matthew as we look at the parable of the wedding feast. Food is only one aspect of a feast. The feast is a great celebration. But weddings in Israel were really a great celebration. They would last about a week. There was one party after the next. Jesus tells this story of the wedding feast as a parable. What's a parable? A parable is a story. It's designed to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. And the context of this parable is a confrontation. And it's a confrontation between Jesus and the ones who should have recognized who he was, the religious leaders of Israel. The parable gives us keen insight into the kingdom of heaven, and this morning we'll study the parable, and then we're going to fast forward to the wedding feast that's coming in the kingdom of God. That's why I entitled this message, Kingdom Conflict and Kingdom Hope. In this world, we will have conflict. Take heart. There's hope, and there's a great day coming. As Jesus entered his final week in Jerusalem, he was teaching in the courts of the temple. And he knew his time had come, and his last messages were often told in parables. They carry an urgency in them because it's near the end. During his ministry, Jesus had attracted a very large following. He was recognized by the Jewish people as a prophet, as a teacher, as a healer. But opposition to Jesus came from the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes. Those are the guys that continually wrote down the scriptures. They didn't have any printing presses, so they had to keep copying them. So they had fresh uh, copies of the scriptures for the priests. But the priests themselves were a problem for Jesus, as were several religious sects. You'll see them in, in your Bible, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
difference between the two, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife. They believed there would be a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. It's a very sad situation, you see. Rome controlled Judea in this time from a political perspective. But the Jewish religious leaders, they were allowed to remain in a position of social and religious power in order for Rome to better maintain control. Control's always been a human issue. These religious leaders had created an establishment that kept them in control over the people. But this had very little relationship to the purpose God had intended for them. These religious leaders coveted their positions of power, and they were jealous of Jesus. Their opposition to him had increased over time, and when he came to Jerusalem that fateful last week, they were looking for ways to rid themselves of him. This story is really about a conflict between two kingdoms. It's the kingdom of this world, which places itself in opposition to the kingdom of God. So let's take a look at two kingdoms in conflict, and we'll start a little bit before our text in Matthew 21 at the rising confrontation with Jewish religious leaders and Jesus. Matthew has shown us both the authority of Jesus through his teaching and through his miracles. But the religious leaders, the scribes, the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were jealous of his authority and they challenged it. They said Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. They asked this question, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you that authority? Jesus answered with a question. He often does that in Scripture. He knew where their hearts were, so he answers with a question. And he said if they answered his question, he would tell him, them where his authority came from. He asked them if what John the Baptist had been doing was from heaven or from men. In other words, what authority was behind John's ministry? These guys, the religious leaders, reasoned correctly that there was no safe answer for them to give Jesus. So they simply said, we don't know. And then Jesus refused to answer their questions about the source of his authority. Jesus directed his teaching to his opposition, the chief priests and the elders at this point. He used several parables leading up to this hard, direct statement. I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. See, the religious leaders saw themselves as righteous men, selected by God to lead the people. They believed that the greatest sinners in Israel were the prostitutes and the tax collectors. The prostitutes represent the immoral. The tax collectors represent thieves. So Jesus' statement offended their person. It offended their position. And it offended their purpose. Their problem was their pride. Then Jesus quotes Psalm 118.22. He says, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The King James Version doesn't say capstone. It says chief cornerstone. I like that. And Jesus is saying that he is that cornerstone, the foundation that was rejected by the builders. The builders are the religious leaders in Israel. But all of this was a marvelous work of God. They rejected Jesus, the chief cornerstone, the rock of the foundation, but he will become the foundation of an altogether new work of God. Then Jesus further shocks them and says this, Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you 
and given to a people who will, say this with me, produce its fruit. Say that again. Produce its fruit. They went away more angry. They were looking for a way to arrest Jesus, but they were scared. They knew the people saw him as a prophet. They should have been supporting the ministry of this prophet, this teacher, this healer. The great irony is they were the ones who led the opposition to his ministry. They were representatives of the kingdom of this world and placed themselves in opposition to the kingdom of God. So let's take a look at the parable of the wedding feast as Jesus tells it. And again, he's directing the message at the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and even killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there that was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This king in the parable had planned a great wedding feast for his son. And the king sent out an invitation for the celebration. Perhaps it was kind of like an RSVP in our terminology. But when no RSVPs came back, he sent out his servants to directly contact the people to ask them to come. But many declined and refused to attend this great celebration. Then the king sent his servants a second time to those who had been invited to tell them what a special feast this really was and that all preparations, listen, all preparations have been made and made for them to come and participate in this great event, his son's wedding. But they were too busy. They were too busy living their lives, working and doing what they saw as more important. And others even reacted violently, seizing the king's servants, beating them, and even killing them. When the king heard this, he was enraged. He sent his army and had the murderers executed and their city destroyed. But listen, when the king decides to have a feast, he's going to have it. And it will be a great celebration. So he sent his servants out again to find others to celebrate with him. They were to invite anyone they found. It says both good and bad. These weren't the elite that had been initially invited, but they responded to the king. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Listen, these guests were glad to be there. The term translated street corners here literally means to the very limits of his territory. 
The king sent out his servants to the ends of his territory to call people to come in and celebrate this great wedding of his son. But that's not the end of the parable. It has even a more surprising end. The king enters the feast, and everyone was dressed in special wedding clothes except for one man. When the king saw this man, he confronted him. The use of the term friends here is probably tongue-in-cheek because the man had insulted the king. This man had no answer for coming to the wedding without the proper garments on. Then the king had the man tied up and thrown out of the wedding feast into the outer darkness, a place of obscurity, a place devoid of light, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus ends the parable with these words, for many are invited, but few are chosen. In the King James Version, I like this better, invited is translated called. Many of you may know it from that perspective, for many are called, but few are chosen. It could also mean appointed, for many are appointed to come, but few are chosen. So how do we understand the parable? The king is God the Father. The son is the Lord Jesus. The servants are prophets and apostles, the people of God that God sent to his people to call them to repentance, to call them to come back to him. The invitation is to repent and to come into the kingdom of God and to become a member of God's family. The initial invitees are the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Those rejecting the invitation are the very religious leaders that had been confronting Jesus and others like them, both in that generation that Jesus walked the earth and many before it. In fact, these men and others like them killed God's servants and would be responsible for the death of Jesus himself. But there were Jews who believed and followed Jesus, and they would also take the good news to those who weren't initially invited. Oh, that would be the Gentiles, that would be us. Many Jewish people, especially the religious leaders, thought of themselves as good people. It's a problem we have in our culture today. Good's a relative term here from the human perspective. In actuality, Paul says this, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. He's quoting out of the Old Testament and writing it in the Romans letter. So God offers his kingdom to the good from a human perspective and the bad. You see, the kingdom of God is open to all who will receive it and respond to God's gracious invitation. Peter says this, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? Repentance. All have sinned. All need forgiveness. All are called to repentance. Here's the conclusion. God's gracious offer of salvation through Jesus is given to many, but will re be received by relatively few. Many people are too busy, wrapped up in their own world, or have their own idea of how to get into heaven, or they're just too busy being angry with God or resisting him. The result, few are chosen. Chosen here relates to God's great foreknowledge. This is how Paul says it. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. 
You see, his choosing is intimately, integrally connected to his foreknowledge. What do we draw from this? I came up with five wedding feast principles. I think I'm, ah, I'm ahead of myself. Chosen is not an arbitrary selection on God's part. It's completely intentional. It's connected to his foreknowledge. They can't be separated. What about kingdom hope? It's about the coming wedding feast in the kingdom of God. God has planned a real wedding feast in the future, and its scope and grandeur will be unprecedented beyond anything that we could even imagine, and way beyond anything that's come before it. John describes it this way in the Revelation. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the rushing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. This is the great wedding feast that Jesus, the Lamb of God, and his church, the bride, will experience together in the future. This is the righteousness of Jesus, the bright, clean garments that they're wearing, which have been given to all who place their trust in him alone and have followed him here in their time on earth. See, like the parable, this feast is available to all who will come. The invitation open to all. The response to the invitation is to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. John says he, Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. That's the Jewish people, the original invitees. But his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God himself. The age of grace that we live in will continue until the total number of those who respond to God's call to come to the wedding feast have accepted their invitation. Others will also be invited, like the Old Testament saints who trusted God before the incarnation of Jesus and the establishment of his church. John adds this in the Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Amen. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. No more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I drew five principles, there's probably a lot more, but I drew five principles from this parable. First, knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. 
The religious leaders of Israel knew the scriptures well. They knew a lot about God. But they missed God walking in their very presence. An intellectual understanding of God is simply insufficient. We're called to know God through Jesus, to allow the Holy Spirit then to direct our lives. We don't want to be in the place of knowing about God, but living in that old, miserable, sinful nature. We need a new, living relationship. Second, God has ordained work, but work is not to be our God. In our busy culture, being busy all the time has become the accepted standard. The people in the parable put their work above their relationship with the king. God calls us to be good workers. He calls us to allow our work to glorify him, but it is not to consume us, and it is not to be our identity. Third, self-righteousness is the rags of man's religion. Righteous acts come out of our relationship with Jesus and result in the wedding garments that his followers will wear. Righteous acts, good works, listen carefully, are the evidence of our relationship with Jesus. They bought us nothing. They come out of that relationship. Salvation is from God's grace alone. But salvation is demonstrated through changing lives. You hear that? Through changing lives. Not totally perfect yet, but lives that are being transformed. Fourth, God's kingdom call demands a kingdom response from his people. Peter says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the call, the call of God that goes out to all people everywhere. But our response to his call matters. And it makes all the difference in our eternal destiny. We both choose to respond to God and are chosen by him. Surrender to his direction is our appropriate response to being called and chosen. Fifth, the coming wedding feast gives us great hope. This great celebration will be the consummation of God's plan to bring us into his kingdom. The kingdom of this world will never bring us true happiness, but the kingdom of God will be far more than any of us can imagine. Paul says that no mere man has ever seen, heard, or even imagined what wonderful things God has ready for those who love the Lord. Come, everything is prepared. So what's our response? Reflecting on the wedding feast principles, as you look at your life today, do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? Do you know him intimately? Are you seeking to follow him more closely in your life? You see, knowing God involves all of us. It involves our mind, our heart, and our actions, head, heart, hand. Second, how busy is your life today? Do you need to reset your priorities? Do you need to reset them to move more closely to following Jesus, to move that to the top of your list? An overly busy life is no substitute for relationship with God. In fact, an overly busy life is an obstacle to relationship with God. Third, what clothes are you wearing? Is it the righteousness of Jesus or the rags of self-righteousness? Do you need a wardrobe change? 
If so, today is exactly the time to begin to change it out. Fourth, your response to God's call is surrender. He sent his invitation to you personally. His heart is for you. It's that you will joyfully, joyfully receive his invitation and allow him to direct your life. It's all God's power that makes this possible, but we have to respond to that invitation. And we have to allow him to do his good work in us before he can do his good work through us. Your kingdom response is surrendering control of your life to him. Surrendering is for your good and his glory. Fifth, Remind yourselves regularly that the kingdom of this world is in opposition to the kingdom of God. This that's around us is not the kingdom of God. Jesus said, for now, the kingdom of God is within you, his followers. One day it will manifest itself throughout all the earth, but that's not today. So don't place our hope in the kingdom of this world. Keep your eyes on the prize. Consciously put your hope. Hope in the scriptures means to be confident, to be expectant on the great things that God has prepared for you in his kingdom, starting with his great wedding feast. Chris, if you and the uh, team will come back up. So those are reflection questions this morning. We're going to come to the Lord's table. We're going to commune with him. We weren't saved to continue to live like we had before we received Jesus. We were saved to live changing, transforming lives so that we would begin to look more and more like Jesus. Not perfect yet. But Paul says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He says, test yourselves. The word we translate examine means to scrutinize ourselves. It means to scrutinize our behavior. It means to push ourselves to achieve a goal. So we're to carefully look at ourselves to see whether our actions and our beliefs actually line up. We're not talking perfection here, but our goal is to be more and more like Jesus. And in doing that, we're called to test ourselves, literally to prove to ourselves that we're truly in the faith. We don't want to deceive ourselves as the man who came to the wedding feast in the parable with the wrong clothes. This morning, as you pray and meditate on the reflection questions that we've talked about, examine your life. Coming to the Lord's table gives us an excellent time for self-examination. If we're honest... With ourselves and before God, each of us has an area or areas in our own life that needs to be conformed to God's purpose for us. Spend time this morning with the Lord. And let him show you what he wants you to see as we commune together. Listen, communion is not only looking back at the great sacrifice of Jesus, Communion is also looking forward. It's a foreshadow of the great wedding feast to come in the kingdom of God. The language that Jesus used in preparing his disciples for his death, resurrection, and return to the Father came straight out of the Jewish wedding ritual. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen, I am going there to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The Jewish wedding ritual was different from ours. Two fathers would come together, the father of the bride and the father of the groom, and if they agreed on this wedding, the, the, the bride and the bridegroom were actually considered married at that point. But the wedding was not consummated yet. What the bridegroom would do is leave, and he would go, and he would prepare a home for he and his bride. And when the home was finished, the bridegroom would come back, and it would always be at night. And there would be a trumpet that blew, and all the people in the town would turn out because the bridegroom had come back for his bride. And then the bridegroom would take his bride to the place that had been prepared. That's exactly what Jesus has promised us. I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's a place you've never seen, but when you get there, you'll know it's home. It's the place you always wanted to be. It's a place like no other place. And he calls us, you come. I've prepared the feast. Everything's ready. It's all been paid for. You come. So this morning, elders, if you will, or ushers, if you'll come, we're going to pass the communion plate. We're going to take communion together. I love to do in tincture. It's very personal. But this morning, we're all going to take together. As we look to the wedding feast of the bride and the bridegroom that's coming. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life. You have been so, so kind to me before I spoke. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. took a breath, you breathe your life in me, and you have been so, so kind to me. your foe, still your love fought for me. 
And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. So kind. is in the bottom cup if you'll take it out on the night that Jesus was betrayed the Passover feast he took bread he blessed it he broke it and he gave it to his disciples he said take eat this is my body broken for you take the bread In a similar manner, after the dinner, he took the cup. This was probably the third of three cups that are part of the Passover celebration, and it's appropriately called the cup of redemption. Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Father, how grateful we are for what Jesus came and did. Something we could never have done for ourselves. We would have just shown up or tried to show up at the wedding feast in dirty clothes. But you've called us into your great family, told us to look to the wedding feast because you have new clothes for us to put on the righteousness of Christ. So we remember. We look forward to the day in the kingdom when he will take it anew with us. Thank you for it in the great name of Jesus and the sons and daughters of God said together, amen. If you'll stand. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, grant you peace. And you're rising up and you're lying down. And you're going out and you're coming in, both now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed.